Welcome to the Picture Language Seminar. It's a real pleasure today to have John Carty. Some people might call him the prince of conformal field theory because John's done so much work on that. And now he's been interested in TT bar deformation. Today he's going to tell us about TD bar deformation of 2D quantum field theory and modular forms. John, the floor is yours. We're looking forward very much to your talk. Okay, I'll just share my screen here. Um, let's see. Right, are you able to see the first slide? Looks perfect. Okay, so I wanted to thank Arthur for this invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about some work I did uh, about a year ago now, and um, but it's a subject that I've been interested in for the last few years. It's about the so-called TT bar deformation of quantum field theory, but in trying to think about it, I realized that a lot of the mathematics can be applied to any kind of, of modular form. So it's, so it's going to start off in the way of mathematical physics in general is the, is the way to start by, by describing the problem loosely from a theoretical physics point of view, so a very heuristic kind of reasoning thing, and at some point we'll try to become mathematically precise, hopefully at a point where we haven't thrown out the baby at the same time as the bathwater, because of the, the, uh, an occasional problem with mathematical physics is that when you have made the the problem mathematically precise, uh, then you've basically assumed what you wanted to prove in the first place. So hopefully I, I won't do that and there'll be something of mathematical c content at the end of, of the process. But I'm going to start off in a heuristic sort of way by explaining what the TT bar deformation is and why it might be of interest to theoretical physicists. I'll then spend a little time talking about what happens to a TT bar deformed massive quantum field theory. And in the spirit of this talk series being about mathematical pictures, I'll mainly be drawing pictures in this part of the talk. As compared with the main part of the talk where I'll talk about the deformation of, of conformal field theories and how one talks about the deformed partition function in a rectangle which will be an example of a holomorphic modular form and then it will turn out that in order to construct a proof of the modular invariance of the deformed partition function one one basically constructs a proof which applies to any kind of deformed modular form and then i'll go through these other examples these other topics here, ending with uh, an example of mass forms, which turn out to play a very interesting role in the whole story. So I'll start off. What is TT bar? It, w it was introduced in a very short paper by Zomologikov in 2004, uh, where he pointed out that this particular, by adding a particular term in the action, uh, it was solvable in some kind of sense. And then that, that work was more or less ignored for, for a while until it was taken up by 
some larger coffins smoking up and a bunch of other people at the same time uh, who were m m more interested in it from the point of view of 2D gravity or ADS CFT and I'm not going to explain that in particular. So, so basically from a heuristic point of view you can think of it as a deformation of the action of a field theory and uh, in fact from a classical point of view it's completely well defined um, it's basically a flow rather than a perturbation though it's a one parameter family of field theories parameterized by this real number lambda which can be positive or negative um, and you deform it and an infinitesimal deformation you add a small piece proportional to the determinant of the stress tensor of the theory that you're deforming. So it's not a perturbation where, where this will be the undeformed stress tensor, it's more a flow. So the reason it's called TT bar is that if you compute to first order about a conformal field theory, then the determinant of the stress tensor I should remind you that the stress tensor uh, is uh, in two dimensions is a two by two matrix so its determinant is therefore quadratic in the elements of the stress tensor. For a conformal field theory the determinant is basically in complex coordinates is the ZZ component times the Z bar Z bar component and in the lingo this is called T and this is called A bar so that so that's why it's called the TT bar affirmation even though once you get to finite lambda it's no longer TT bar because there's a non-zero trace to the stress tensor because this lambda has the dimensions of length squared so it's no longer a conformal field theory it actually has a scale in it um, and I've been trying to press the, maybe we shouldn't call it the TT bar deformation we should call it the debt T deformation but that doesn't roll off the tongue in quite the same way so, it, so it's never changed everybody still calls it the TT bar deformation even though that's not, not what it really is. So, the, so from a perturbative point of view, if you think about the, 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 a determinant, because the stress tensor has the same dimension as space-time, it has dimension 2 in two dimensions, so the determinant has dimension 4, <coughs> has dimension four and that means that from a perturbative point of view this looks like a non renormalizable interaction. Nevertheless, as Hamalogikov showed, there are certain quantities if you calculate them that are in fact UV finite. In fact the whole spectrum is and, and the partition function is and so on. Uh, even if you calculate correlation functions about which I wrote a paper in 2019, there are only logarithmic divergences there, uh, and and you can absorb these by renormalization, and you get a very interesting non-local form for the correlation functions. Um, anyway, I guess one reason that physicists are interested in it is that it's an example of an ultraviolet completion of a theory uh, which is which is non-local and has a fundamental <laughs> length scale and that's what we might believe that string theory could be uh, for, for fundamental physics or some kind of quantum gravity which is bound to have that Planck length in it somewhere so it's an example of a UV completion
and it's one that we can calculate with. So I guess that's 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 reason to go ahead with it from the physics point of view. But there's also evidence that if you think about holography, about the ADS-CFT correspondence, then at least if this has a certain sign, it corresponds to going a, a finite distance, quote, into the bulk. And I won't say any more about that, apart from it being another reason to study this t t affirmation. So I'll talk a little bit about classical field theory, where it's much more easily defined. <laughs> so uh, if you write out the determinants in components, you can write it in terms of the epsilon tensor in this way here. And I should remind you that the definition of the stress tensor or the energy momentum tensor, depending on whether we're in Euclidean or, or Minkowski space, is that it basically gives you the response of the action to a change in the metric. Okay, so this ought to be delta S with a superscript lambda here. So if you compare these two equations, one way to interpret this is that we are looking at the change in the action due to a change in the metric which itself is proportional to the stress tensor. And then if you go through the equations, the fact that the stress tensor is conserved is is a condition on this change of metric and and, and you then find that if the, if the metric started off being Euclidean then it or or flat anyway then it remains flat so it's basically therefore equivalent to a, a, a epimorphism where we basically change our coordinates um, and the change of coordinates is going to be basically basically given in terms of what the change of the metric would be if we change our, our, our ordinance. So we have a change, we have this <laughs> epimorphism here, and if we now integrate this with respect to x, so x of lambda here is going to depend upon x, because t depends upon x, then next slide. What we basically find is that we can write the change in the coordinates as an integral, as a line integral of the energy momentum tensor up to some fiducial point which I'll call minus infinity. Well, it could be any point, it doesn't really matter. It's uh, it, the actual physics is independent of where you start the integration from. And if you stare at this for a bit, you can see that this, apart from this epsilon tensor here, is proportional to the flux of the en energy momentum across this line from minus infinity to x. So if we take this to be uh, a constant time uh, a constant time contour uh, then basically what we see is that the change in the spatial coordinate x1 is proportional to the energy flux across the line to the left of x so basically um, and the and the change in the time coordinate is minus the momentum flux so if I look at the first equation here I, I, I'm basically at some particular uh, at, at some particular point in space on on this line I look to my I look to my left and I count how much energy there is in that half space on my left and uh, and then I move proportionately a distance to the right and then uh, I look at the momentum 
the total momentum to my left and I advance my time coordinate. So if you think about um, a non-relativistic limit or e even if we're talking about a relativistic theory, but, uh, but let's assume that we have particles and all the energy is just concentrated in the rest mass of these particles and they're all at rest. So I have a bunch of particles here on the real line and basically um, um, if I if I look at what happens to the, to this particular particle here I'm pointing to um, then it looks to its left and it counts one particle here and that's one unit of energy so it, so it moves to the right by by an amount lambda and the next particle sees two particles to its left that is two units of energy and it moves a distance two lambda and the next one sees three and it moves a distance three lambda and so on okay so it's a it's a it, it, it's an extension of the of the space coordinate and similarly as we'll see of the time coordinate in a way that that depends upon the distribution of energy and, and momentum but another way to think about this is that you is that you maintain the same distance between the particles but you give them a finite width so 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 here i give each particle a width proportional to a lambda times its mass and and i make this distance from here to here the same as this distance from here to here and as you see it's an equivalent shift in, in the position of the left-hand end of each particle. So, so basically, at least from a non-relativistic point of view, or in the rest frame of these relativistic particles, <coughs> um, it's the same as going from some hardcore interaction, assuming that they do have some interaction when they meet, to hard rods. So this, of course, is a well-known problem in statistical mechanics going from hard core particles to hard rod, hard rod particles. And it's well known that it's exactly solvable in one dimension. So, uh, so this is the underlying root cause of why the TT bar deformation is solvable, is that it's basically this, this fact that it's a deform is that you can think of it as a deformation of the space which, between each particle or giving each particle a finite width. But if, but we want to talk about relativistic theories and so here's an, an example of what happens to a single particle when you boost it. So this is a bit complicated here but in the rest frame of the particle, that's the blue, the blue frame, that particle has a certain energy which is indicated on the vertical axis here. That's its P0. And it has a certain width proportional to P0. And then I boost it and the energy of the particle becomes catch a special component which is indicated by red here it's a Lorentz boost so it's not a rotation okay and then what what happens to this horizontal line is that it gets uh, is that there's a time shift and also a, a, a Lorentz interaction or extension depending on how how you think about it. So, so as this particle moves in the direction of its energy momentum, 
if you look at the world line of this particle, it goes along here, and it's going to sweep out this this strip, which is indicated by the thin red lines here, and the projection onto the space on onto a constant time slice in the moving frame is from here to here, and it's proportional to lambda p zero still in the moving frame and and there is this tilt of the particle proportional to lambda p1 the momentum so it's all all i want to say is is what this picture tells you is that it's completely consistent with the relativistic invariance that there's a way of defining what it means to have a hard rod in a relativistic theory. Okay, so, and the interesting thing is this is completely consistent with what happens if you have scattering. So, if you have, for example here, I've drawn a picture which is supposed to illustrate elastic scattering, multiple elastic scattering, and of course this picture here is very important if you're talking about an integrable theory and the Yang-Baxter equations, because this equals something else. What happens is that each particle gets a certain width, um, and because the energy is conserved at each scattering, that means that the width is conserved. So you end up getting pictures like this, where, where this particle scatters elastically here off this one here and the total width during the scattering process is conserved. And if you look at this very carefully, where I've drawn the centre lines of where the particles are, there's a little bit of time delay here. And that's because of this time delay due to the fact that the centre of mass momentum is non-zero. So, uh, and this kind of picture works also for inelastic scattering also. So, so here's a picture of two particles scattering. They have equal, they have the same mass, but they have equal and opposite momentum but they scatter into a heavy particle and a light particle and and everything here is consistent. The width is conserved. The, the, the width of, of this particle plus this one is the same as this one plus this one and everything is consistent. Here's an example of the decay of a heavy particle into a light particle and a, and a heavier particle once again, everything is consistent. So it turns out that when you stare at these pictures and these multiple scattering events for a long time, and each picture basically corresponds to a dissection of Minkowski space in, in which each, each white space in between the scattering, in, in, in between these fat world lines is translated and it's translated in a consistent manner. I think we can see that more clearly in this picture here where we've got three, three, three scatterings and, and this triangle here is supposed to be congruent to this triangle here. It's just each, each piece of Minkowski space suffers a translation and that translation depends upon the energy and momentum of the particles. So that's, an, that's a nice picture. Um, what it basically leads to though, oh, I, I, I should say all this is classical. How does it possibly square with, with, with the fact that, that we can't at the same time measure the position and the momentum of each particle because that's what I'm basically doing here. I'm saying 
this particle has a definite momentum and I can tell you where it is because I want to say it comes in here and it scatters here. This picture seems entirely classical and of course it is but we can get away with it because we don't need to actually do this. All we need to do is to specify what the left and right edges of each particle are because that tells us how the space-time gets gets distorted and the, and the width of the particles which is xr minus x left commutes with the total with the average momentum with the momentum of the particle so even in a quantum theory this makes sense it's just that in these pictures we are drawing uh, well they are like usual S matrix pictures where we're not where we're just saying what the momentum of the different particles is or the rapidities we're not actually saying where they are in space and if you think about this a bit more and I won't go into this because it's a bit off topic here um, all, all that this teaching bar deformation does is that it doesn't change the asymptotic states of the theory it doesn't actually change the, the spectrum of, of particles so, so, we're, so, so we're still talking about this, the same space of asymptotic states it's just going to affect the S matrix and it does so by, by, by these phase factors, by these CDD factors, uh, which um, where you can see if you look at it that the phase is going to, the, 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 if there's a certain energy then this is going to cause, uh, this couples to the momentum which corresponds to an infinitesimal translation. So it's not very hard to see that it just multiplies the asymptotic states by these phase factors. Um, and, and all of this has been shown to be consistent by these guys and also some Logikov and Smirnoff worked on this. Um, and so multiplying by these kind of CDD factors doesn't change the fact that the S matrix is unitary and we've got crossing and unitarity and all of that. Um, but this does actually change the high energy behavior of the theory and that's because it becomes non-local. So actually factors like this would normally be ruled out on the basis of locality but because we're generating a, a, a non-local theory here that's what, what actually happens and this is what is supposed to happen if we have some kind of gravitational theory too. In fact in this paper here what these guys did was to show that this was equivalent to what they called a gravitational dressing of, of, the, the, of the, the, the theory. But I'm going to be talking about not the asymptotic particle spectrum, I'm going to be talking about a deformed conformal field theory and uh, it has a much more dramatic effect because we're not going to be talking so much about what happens at a definite energy which is which is reasonably clear but, w but we want to understand what's going to happen at, at a finite temperature and then it's going to be more complicated because what we want to do is to work out the partition function. Uh, so, so I'll start with now talking about a conformal field theory and undeformed conformal field theory just to start with and I'm going to be talking about the partition function of uh, this conform field theory in a rectangle and the reason that I'm going to do this because not normally we, 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 usually we start talking about a torus but that's a bit more complicated 
I'll start with the partition function in a rectangle so you should think of the horizontal axis as being space the vertical direction as being imaginary time but we're not going to we're not going to identify the top and the bottom which really would be finite temperature we're just going to talk about some boundary condition here on the conformal field theory on the boundary of the rectangle so r is space r2 is like inverse temperature but it's not quite because we don't have periodic boundary conditions here anyway a little known fact is that for any two-dimensional conformal field theory the partition function in a rectangle is known exactly and it only depends on the central charge of the conformal field theory and it's basically the Dedekind eta function which I defined here where q is this is the usual e to the minus 2 pi times the aspect ratio here the dedekind eta function raised to a power which is basically the basically minus the, the central charge over two and this prefactor here means that it's not exactly scale invariant and that comes from the fact that if you look at a conformal field theory in a domain which has sharp corners on the boundary uh, this actually breaks the scale invariance by an amount proportional to the central charge. This is something that, he, he, that Ingo Peschel and me found um, a long time ago, but it, it really goes back to work of Katz, who talked about, can one hear the shape of a drum? And uh, it's basically all the same stuff, but generalized to a general conformal field theory. Anyway, that's the formula here, and I'm just going to play with this, but I'm going to play with it just as an example of a modular form. So the reason that, of course, the main thing, when I talk about modular invariance here, all I really mean is that if I inter interchange space and imaginary time, that is interchange R1 and R2, I should get the same answer. So there should be the symmetry of the partition function in the rectangle and that's what I'm talking about when I say modular invariant here. And the reason that this expression here is modular invariant is that the dedekind eta function is basically a modular form of weight one half. Uh, um, that is, it transforms, if you call delta, which is R2 over R1, it's this ratio here, and I don't think I defined it, but the delta is R2 over R1. So, so the modular transformation is delta goes to 1 over delta. Then it transforms in this way, and that guarantees that, it, at least in a conformal field theory, that it's invariant. Okay, so the Q expansion of this modular form, which I've written here, is basically a spectral decomposition if you think about this as being imaginary time and and so so energy is when we write a spectral decomposition we think about some Hamiltonian as being the generator of infinitesimal t t translations in 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 the, in the in the time direction, so uh, spectral decomposition would would look something like like this, where these are the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, and because we don't have periodic boundary conditions, it's not quite a trace, but there's a matrix element here and here. So I can write this as some kind of spectral decomposition over some row zero. Uh, which includes the matrix elements, and and the point is that is that even if I know the energies here, and even if I know the matrix elements, this way of writing the partition function is not obviously modular invariant. 
in this case we 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 know it is because of special modular properties of eta but in general once you write it this way it's not obviously modular invariant and that's the whole power of modular invariance in a conformal field theory in that when you write it this way you can use modular invariant as a constraint on on the energies and the matrix elements but so the way i'm going to generalize this picture to more general kind of mathematics is that i'm going to think about a more general modular form of weight k now i should the reason that i put modular form here in inverted commas is that if you look at the textbook definition of a modular form then then in fact in fact uh, k has to, has to be an integer or a half integer, integer at least depending on what on whether you're talking about the whole modular group or a subgroup but um here here i'm i'm going to think about anything that has a q expansion a conversion q expansion and transforms like this under delta goes to one over delta so usually the thing that i'm calling delta is called i times tau so it's usual it's 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 just more convenient to think about this existing in the right half delta plane rather than the upper half tau plane uh, but, but um so whenever you see delta in in a formula here then you you should think of it as i times tau so 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 that this is basically tau goes to one plus tau what's called t the, the, the generator t of the modular group and this is the generator s of the modular group okay so the way that we want to get the tt bar to <laughs> affirmation of a modular form is that w is that we are going to think of space being being stretched proportional to the energy okay so, so if we work as in the fixed e ensemble that's the micro canonical ensemble that will be very easy because the energy will be fixed and and so the uh, and so the whole space will be stretched or compressed by an, an amount proportional to the energy but we want to work at f effectively at finite temperature that means that that means that we have lots of states we we have a distribution of states of different energies and and the space r1 is going to change by an amount which depends upon the energy and 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 so at least formally we would define the deformed partition function by an equation that looks like that looks like this however there's a problem with this equation in that it doesn't look really to make sense i mean for one thing rho zero is a bunch of delta functions uh, another thing that can happen is that some of these energies are negative, some are positive. So, so, uh, so the so the effective size of the system, according to this equation, could become negative. What does that mean? And so on. But at least it, one thing that I do want to point out is that if you if we could make sense of this equation here then we would get a very simple differential equation for the evolution of the partition function because if you differentiate this expression with respect to lambda you bring out an e times the derivative and then you then you then 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 
you can see that that's basically the derivative with respect to R1 and R2 of the partition function, at least formally. And you can see why there might be a problem here, because this is sort of like a diffusion equation, but this isn't an elliptic operator here. And so, so it's not clear that the solution is, 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 is unique, and that's connected with the cell expression here being somewhat ill-defined. And our goal here is to try to make it mathematically well-defined in such a way that we can show that the deformed partition function or a deformed modular form in general is indeed modular invariant. So, so the questions are, can we make sense of this? If we can, is the deformed partition function going to be invariant? That means if we take a general modular form here and we deform it according to the way that we're going to define it, is it going to be, does it continue to have the same modular property? So it turns out that we can make sense of, the, of the, <laughs> this equation basically by thinking of rho zero, which was a positive quantity. It was the density of states times a matrix element squared as the imaginary part of some analytic function, which is going to be the Laplace transform. So, so the idea is to write the partition function, the undeformed partition function, as the inverse Laplace transform of, of, of some quantity. And then if you pull back the contour in S and wrap it around the branch cut of this thing here, you will get the expression that, that I had on, on the previous slide. But, but as soon as you have it in this more analytic form here, then you, then you see that that you can make sense of of, of, of what we had on uh, on the previous slide. Instead of deforming rho zero, we deform an analytic function, which we can do in a nice analytic way, because it turns out in a conformal field theory, because of, of, of the scale invariance. That, that that this particular function has a nice scaling form here and, and everything is analytic. And then, quote, after some algebra, you get an expression that looks like this at the top here. So here it's a bit complicated and I'll rapidly go through it. But what you basically see is that what we've done is to take the the Laplace transform of the undeformed modular form and uh, and now we have the deformed modular form as an inverse La 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 Laplace transform with an integral of s here along the imaginary axis e to the s delta and, and, and what we have in here is basically some kind of linear integral kernel. So, so this is basically going to be a linear operation on the space of modular forms. And alpha is going to be the dimensionless version of our deformation constant. So our deformation parameter lambda has the dimensions of length squared. We can make it dimensionless by dividing by the area and the nice thing, of course, about the area is that it, it, it itself is, is, is invariant under interchanging R1 and R2. So that's a modular invariant definition of the, mod, of the deformation parameter. And now, if you stare at this for long enough, you'll convince yourself everything is nicely, absolutely convergent, blah, blah, blah. And, it, and we can use it as a definition. So this is a mathematical, the well-defined definition of what we mean by the deformed modular form. It's just this inter integral kernel acting on the undeformed one. And then we do some more algebra. So there are, there are two different things you can, you can do with this. 
first of all, you, you see this exponential here is quadratic in S. That means you can think about completing the square. And if you do that and go through some more steps, what you find is that you can write this inter integral kernel in terms of this object k alpha times a couple of powers here times an invariant integration here. So this integ integration measure here is invariant and uh, under delta goes goes to 1 over delta. And when you write down this 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 kernel here, this is really the important part of, part of it. It's a kind of a smooth, smooth, it's kind of a Gaussian smearing in delta space, except the amount of smearing depends on where you are in modulus, in, in moduli space. But the important thing about this kernel here, if you think about it, is that it's invariant under delta goes to 1 over delta, delta prime goes to 1 over delta prime. And the same thing here, although it's maybe a little bit harder to see. And alpha, our deformation parameter, appears here. So as alpha goes to zero, this becomes a delta function, basically. Um, it says that delta prime equals delta, and there's a amount of appearing here. So the invariance of this kernel under, under delta goes to 1 over delta tells us that if this thing is invariant, so is the deformed one, and, and, and that is the basis of a proof that this expression here uh, preserves the modular properties of the function f. But now we're going to do something different. We are going to assume that f has a Q-series expansion, that is, it's expanded in powers of e to the minus 2 pi delta, and see what happens, because then... So here I've just repeated the same expression. If now we insert this, this Q-series in terms of f0, we can then, if you look at it very carefully, delta prime occurs here, it's linearly in the exponential and appears here, so that we can do the delta prime integration term by term, and we get an expression for each term here, gives us an expression here as an integral over s. And, and we now have something quadratic in the denominator because there's an s here and an s here. So, 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 so this gives us a couple of poles here at s plus and s minus. And if you look at it, only the poles at s minus are to the left of this contour. So we can pull the contour back, pick up the residue, and we get this horrible looking expression here. So, so basically what has happened is that this term here, this rather simple exponential, has gone over to something like this. This is a change in the spectrum of the Hamiltonian, basically. So, so in, instead of being linear in linearly spaced here, it's a, it's a square root. So this is basically the formula that was originally discovered by some logic of way back um, for the GT bar deformation of the spectrum of a conformal field theory. But we've got some more information here. All, all this mess outside uh, tell us how the matrix elements in this particular case between the bottom state and the top state uh, form and the, and and the amazing thing is that if 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 somebody gave you this expression and told you that it was invariant under under delta or it had a simple modular property under delta goes to one over delta you would say, no way does it, it's way too messy.
but it does. So, uh, so, uh, so a nice example uh, that we're all very familiar with is the is is the, the Jacobi theta function evaluated at zero. Uh, it's a it's a standard problem in any any uh, undergraduate math methods course. You apply the Poisson sum formula here, and 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 you find that apart from this factor here, it, it's the same at one over delta and delta. So the deformation of this object looks something like this. Here's the Zamolnikov spectrum in this case, and here's the the deformation of the matrix element. So so once again, this. This deformed Jacobi theta function enjoys the same modular properties as the undeformed one. And, and once again, if someone were to give you this and ask you to prove it, then it, it might take you a, 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 a little while because if you just try and apply the Poisson's hump some formula, you rapidly end up at an integral that you can't actually do analytically. But but it's but it is but it is never that's true. Okay. So I, I'll talk a little bit about about what happens to the Mellon transform of this. So if we have any modular form, if we take the the, the Mellon transform with respect to delta, then we get what is essentially a, a Dirichlet series. So there is this very close connection between the theory of modular forms and the theory of Dirichlet series. Now, if you apply the, if you take the Mellon transform of the deformed modular form, and I won't go through this because it's just algebra. Oh, oh, yes, I, I ought to say that an important point of the connection between modular forms and direct like series is that the is the is the Mellon transform is an analytic function apart from inside a strip and it enjoys this reflection property which is a consequence of the modular properties here now if we take the Mellon transform of the deformed modular form well then, of course, it's not really strictly a Dirichlet series because the, the because the because the spectrum isn't is not linear anymore. It's got all these square roots. Nevertheless, what we can easily prove is that the deformed Mellon transform is a universal function, which happens to be a confluent hypergeometric function. I won't write it down, times the undeformed one. And it's entire, that's the important thing, it's an entire function of S, depending only on K. And it enjoys the same reflection property. So so there's a couple of things that, that one can say here, is that, is that this basically shows that if we take the Mellon transform, in a sense, it diagonalizes the TT bar flow in 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 the space of these deformed modular functions. And also, if 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 this function has has zeros, then the deformed one inherits those zeros because this function does not have any poles. So, in particular, if we start with the Jacobi theta function that I wrote down before, more or less, though not exactly, but more or less, the associated 
the Heracle series is is the is the, is the Riemann zeta function. So if this were the Riemann zeta function, it's basically saying that the, the, the deformed Riemann's Riemann zeta function inherits the zeros. Uh, so if the Riemann hypothesis is true of this, it's also true of this. But it could have extra zeros, of course, due to this I here. Unfortunately, this doesn't seem to be a, a simple way of proving the, the Riemann hypothesis. Otherwise, I wouldn't, I, I, I wouldn't be talking to you now. Okay, so now let's uh, talk about the Taurus briefly. Uh, yes, I realize I only have a few minutes left. Um, so now we're going to talk about the partition function on the Taurus as an example of a real modular form rather than a holomorphic one. So the easiest way to think about the Taurus in this context is not through the normal modular parameter tau, which is useful in a conformal field theory because it's scale invariant. It doesn't depend upon the the size of the torus, but but but, but now because the, the the because the deformation is no longer scale invariant, it's easier just to talk about the two toruses being. Uh, a tiling of the complex plane in the way that I indicated here. So R1 and R2 are the elementary lattice vectors, which you can think of as the size of of, of this parallelogram here. So once again, in the undeformed case, we can write a spectral decomposition if we think about R1 as being in as being a time slice here, then the then the actual energy or the time component here, I'm thinking of everything as being a, a two vector or a complex number. The actual the time component of the energy momentum is in this oops, is in this direction here. And I'm quantizing along here, so that's basically what this uh, this expression here is. And we can write this as a double sum of a Q and Q and Q complex conjugate. I don't know why I didn't write Q bar. That's the normal thing, but it's uh, yes, I wrote Q star anyway. So uh, so this thing being being a partition function. Uh, is real and it's a real modular form and it's modular oh uh, well it will be modular invariant if it were the partition function or we can think about the one point function of a scalar operator on on the torus in which case it deforms according to some k which is related to the scaling dimension of the of the field whose one point function we're, con we're calculating. So the evolution is simple in a fixed frame that R1 lambda deforms linearly in this. This N2 is the energy. That's the one place in my slides where I went back to my original notation. So N2 is basically E and this leads to a similar linear partial to differential equation for the evolution of the one point function, or you can think about uh, the partition function on a torus, which looks like like this. And, and once again, this is sort of ill defined because this is not an elliptic operator, and we uh, and so we aren't sure from this point of view that the solution is unique. Nevertheless, we can go through the same construction. It just gets a wee bit more complicated. We can do a double Laplace transform. Here is what the equivalent expression was. Here's the kernel, uh, an expression here. 
interestingly, in the in the in the case of the Taurus, this kernel is well known as the Selberg kernel. And 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 you can use an expression like this to prove that the deformed modular form transforms in the same way as the undeformed one. And you can now look at this expression, you can plug in a Q series here. This is once again linear in delta and we can do the integral over delta and then you find something that looks like this. And here's the deformed spectrum. This is the result that Samalotikov got once again. And here's, if we have a one-point function, then we have this, this complicated formula here. If it's the partition function, it's easier. But, but the main thing is that, according to this, argument then this complicated horrible expression here it has the same modular properties as the undeformed one so almost my last slide here if we're talking about real real modular forms then of course there are so many real real modular forms that it's not very interesting so one way to make it more, one way to restrict the class of real modular forms in an interesting way is to replace the requirement that they be holomorphic with one that they be eigenfunctions of the Laplacian of the invariant Laplacian with, with respect to the Poincaré metric on the half plane uh, and that's basically the case here so it, so it turns out that then things become extremely simple if you just look at the deformation of a mass form that is if you if you go back to this partial differential equation which by itself was ill-defined but if you substitute in that, that we want to have a scaling solution which is going to be a function of the dim of the dimensionless modular invariant deformation parameter so our deformation parameter here was lambda this thing makes it dimensionless but also r1 which r2 is the area of the of the torus which is modular invariant of course then and a, a function of, of the modular ratio which is a complex number then after a little bit of algebra, algebra this second order differential operator turns out to be proportional to the Laplacian acting on f so so then uh, this ill-defined equation here it becomes a very simple diffusion equation on on the upper half plane and it's uh, with respect to the S invariant Laplacian which is of course elliptic so everything is very well defined this has a positive spectrum and so if F, F if the undeformed F has an eigenvalue lambda then all that happens is that the deformed one is just a constant which depends exponentially on the deformation parameter times the undeformed one so the mass forms are eigenfunctions of the tt bar deformation so so it's kind of interesting because mass forms, uh, as far as my understanding of them goes, are, are, are rather curious. There are these Eisenstein series which give examples of mass forms, and there's, uh, as well as these, as those which give you a continuous series, there are this discrete series of mass forms with, with rather 
with very hard to calculate eigenvalues and uh, and they've only done it for the first few few mass forms few few probably now being a large number but it's still an in interesting problem in, in <laughs> mathematics and if we can make sense of the TT bar deformation in physics this sort of brings in mass forms in an interesting way into physics so a couple of remarks uh, I won't go on to this but people who know a bit more about TT bar would probably have questions about what happens for lambda negative, which is the interesting case if you're talking about ADS CFT. And then it turns out, yes, you can solve this equation or write down an, an expression in both corners of the moduli space, that is near Q equals zero and near Q, Q equals one, but they're not continuously connected. So even though the modular transform of this one is the same as this one and, and vice versa in a sense because they're not continuously connected to each other modular invariance is quote broken um, so that's the uh, that's the answer to the usual question i sometimes get at this point so 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 very very briefly what I try to show you is that the nice properties of the TT bar deformation of conformal field theories extend to more general mathematical objects. I haven't shown you, but, it, but in fact, if you want to preserve a discrete spectrum, then this TT bar deformation is unique in some sense. And we would like to understand what is the significance for physics of mass forms or going back to the holomorphic case of Mellon transforms with respect to the modulus. Because in physics we usually don't think about taking the Mellon transform of a partition function with respect to the modular parameter, but maybe it does have some sense. And I think that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John, for a beautiful talk and for a great deal of food for thought. I'm going to unshare your screen so that we can see each other. And uh, I hope that there'll be discussion. Please, when you ask any questions, turn on your video so we can see you and have a face-to-face -face meeting. So I see Yulia has her hand up. Why don't you start the discussion? Maybe perhaps that was an accident. So, so John, do you actually have a closed form solution of these deformed quantum field theories? Um, well, do you, do you mean, do I know all the correlation functions? Yes. Um, in theory, uh, well, let's see. I know the correlation functions in, in in infinite flat space because they obey a rather simple deformation but the correlation functions uh, as i said acquire logarithmic divergences but you can renormalize re them i ha i have a very explicit expression for the fourier transform of the two point function in particular. Very nice. Are there, are there other people who have questions or comments? Um, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I just wanted to, uh, it was a beautiful talk, John. I, I learned a lot. So this uh, partial differential equation you have, um, you don't know that it has a unique solution. Do you need to specify boundary conditions or something? Yeah, 
Yeah. Yes, I mean, basically the the integral expression that I write down satisfies the PDE, you know. So it, it's a way of specifying a sensible solution. Um, but I don't know. But I don't know, quite know how to specify boundary conditions in a way that it's that the solution is unique. I, I, I'm not sure that it's a well posed problem, but okay. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, assume you have an integrable model on the lattice satisfying, for instance, young Baxter's equation. Is the TT bar deformed satisfying also the young Baxter's? Or yes, deformed? yes, yes. In fact, one thing that I didn't mention is I talked about S matrices and CDD yes. factors. Of course, you can talk about Boltzmann weights for an integral lattice model and they look very much like S matrices. I see. Uh, uh, at least from a mathematical point of view. So, so, you, so you can basically think about multiplying the Boltzmann weights by CDD factors. Uh, and that's, just, that's all it is there. So it, it's probably not all that interesting from that point of view. Okay. Although I, I, I think it would become interesting if you were talking about what went on in a finite volume or a finite temperature, because then, then of course, all this distortion of the space or the space time is easy to think about in an infinite space because, because you don't have boundaries. But, 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 as, but as soon as you start expanding the space and it only has a certain amount of space that it can expand into, then something is going to happen. And that's basically where these Hagedorn transitions come from. Yeah. Uh, if you look in the literature on TT bar, there's a certain amount of discussion of Hagedorn transitions and that kind of thing. And that's one thing that can happen. Thank you, it's beautiful. Thank you. So, so you explained uh, about how the TT bar deformation was uh, related to hard, hard rods, right? I mean, you, uh, it's basically, if you think about massive particles, you can think uh, at least classically uh, as them being relativistic hard rods. Yeah. And for for easy model, what would that what would that mean? Is there a nice interpretation for? Well, if you think about the lattice, if you think about the easing model as well, no, uh, well, I've got to think about it in one plus one dimensions. Okay. Yes. So I I'm thinking about a transverse. Yes. Easing model. And then I think it would probably make sense that you just think about, um, if you think about it from a lattice gas, I'm getting stuck. So it's a good question, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Are there any other comments? Uh, I, I, I have a, a question. Um, does periodic boundary conditions uh, mean anything for this uh, case of hard of uh, particles? Uh, yes, I mean one thing that happens. Just think about it from an. an non-relativistic point of view, then depending on, then if you have hard rods in in a finite 
volume of, of space, but then eventually they're going to get too big and there's no space in between them. So, the, so there's a, there is a kind of a, a jamming transition that happens there. And the other thing that can happen is that if you have the other sign of the deformation parameter, so that the particles have negative width, which 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 is hard to think about, but you but you just think about the space bet between them as increasing in size, then then the density of states starts to take off, starts to increase exponentially because the more energy you have or the more particles you have the greater is the volume and 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 then the, the, then the density of states increases too fast with with the energy and you have a maximum temperature that's what's called a hagedorn transition so there's all kinds of interesting things that go on even in the non in the non relativistic case. The thing that I don't quite understand though is the interpretation as a change of coordinates on the torus. Uh, what do you do when it moves out of one side of the torus and comes in the other side? Oh, it just changes the. It just changes the whole size of the torus. So, so I said, I I integrate my my equation up to some fiducial point x. Mm -hmm. X is on the is at some point on the, on the torus. So, so I integrate one way and I integrate around the other way, and I find that the whole circumference of the torus changes. So all the particles are in different sized toruses then? Yes, it's, that's, the, that's the thing that's hard to get your head around. But the size of the torus depends upon the energy of the state. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, you've given us a great deal of food for thought, John. Thank you again. Thank you, a really beautiful talk. And uh, <laughs> We look forward to seeing you again next week. We'll have a talk then by Kai Feng Bu. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye bye.